Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Missouri Room at the Missouri Athletic Club. My name is Brent Boimer, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the 107th president of the MAC. Welcome to this evening's celebration of soccer in St. Louis. It is certainly a very exciting time to be a soccer fan in our town with the official debut of St. Louis City SC starting next weekend. I want to congratulate and thank our speaker series chairman, Governor Steve Albert, Governor Chris Swank, and their entire speaker series committee for putting together yet another outstanding and timely event. At the conclusion of dinner, Governor Albert is going to introduce our speakers and honor guests. But before we get to dinner, I would like to recognize our sponsors. A special thank you to Enterprise Bank and Trust. From the outset of the speaker series, Enterprise has been a key supporting sponsor and once again have stepped up this evening. So thank you, Enterprise. I would also like to thank and recognize Munganest St. Louis Acura and Alton Toyota. The Munganest Alton Toyota team supports many of our events at the club, including our soccer related events, specifically the Herman Trophy Banquet and the high school all-star games. They have provided the MAC logoed water bottles that are at your table for you to take home tonight. Thank you again to the team from Munganast. And finally, I'd like to use this opportunity to point out a couple of other outstanding events which are coming up here at the club. First, the Women Business Owners Roundtable event on Tuesday, April 4th. We will have the opportunity to hear from Build-A-Bear Workshop founder, and I like this, former Chief Executive Bear, Maxine Clark, and we can hear about her many professional accomplishments as well as her work in our community to improve educational opportunities and to promote and mentor women and minority owned 
entrepreneurship enterprises. And finally, our next speaker series event, and that event is featured on the back of your program, if I'm not mistaken, will take place on May 20, Wednesday, May 24th, and we'll feature a presentation from Jim McKelvey, the co-founder of Block and Cultivation Capital, who will present on the topic of the future of technology in St. Louis. I am confident that both of these upcoming events will be very compelling and well worth your time. Now, if you would please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, bless our time together this evening. We thank you for the sport of soccer and the talents and abilities that you have bestowed upon our featured speaker and honored guests. More importantly, we are grateful for their professionalism and the pride with which they have represented the St. Louis community. This evening, we ask for a special measure of your blessing throughout the inaugural season of our new professional MLS franchise, St. Louis City SC. We thank you especially for the work, patience, persistence and dedication of Caroline Kindle, the Taylor family and the Kavanaugh family in making professional so MLS soccer in St. Louis a reality. May all those who play the game and those who support the players, whether as coaches, trainers, administrators or fans, do so with courage, dedication and a competitive spirit of sportsmanship. Thank you for the outstanding meal that we are about to enjoy and for the work of the men and women who have prepared and serve it for our nourishment. At the conclusion of this event, we ask for safe travels home and peaceful rest. In your name we pray, amen. Enjoy dinner. Well, let's go ahead and get the program started tonight. If I could get everyone's attention and get the, get the real entertainment up here to start the program. Well, welcome to the Missouri Athletic Club Speaker Series. What a great night to celebrate soccer in St. Louis. I'm Steve Albert, I'm Regional President with Enterprise Bank and Trust. I'm on the Board of Governors of the, of the MAC and I also chair the Speaker Series. Thank you for supporting soccer and thank you for supporting the Speaker Series. The Speaker Series started back in August of 2021 to be an exclusive event for MAC members and their guests to actively engage with national and regional leaders that are impacting community, sports, business and leadership. Tonight is a celebration of how the sport of soccer has been and continues to impact our community, sports, business, and leadership. There's so many people tonight that I wanna to thank for making tonight happen. First, I wanna thank our committee members for coming up with this idea. Thank you for your leadership and ideas to bring the MAC Speaker Series to life. Thank you to the MAC team for tonight. Thank you, Wally. G Wally Smith, GM of the MAC, thank you for your leadership and support. And thank you to our team who are taking great care of you tonight. And most importantly, and I know he's over here still trying to plan for tonight's event, is Jim Wilson. Jim is the architect of the Herman Trophy Award and for tonight's event. And is, his touch is on every major event we do at the MAC. So thank you to Jim Wilson, who's still planning the event. Hey, thank you to our guests tonight. Thank you to our St. Louis Soccer Hall of Famers, Al Trost, Ty Keogh, Brad Davis, Steve Trichu, and Lori Kolupny. Thank you for being here tonight. And thank you, to, thank you to Bradley Cornell, head coach of the St. Louis City Soccer Club. I'm super excited to learn about the team, the players, and the upcoming season, so thank you for being here tonight. And of course, thank you to Taylor Twelman uh, for emceeing tonight. It's, a, it's an honor to have you back in St. Louis and here at the MAC. So thank you, Taylor. And lastly, and really most importantly, you know, I want to like to thank the person who really made tonight happen. You know, our committee was, uh, had this idea to partner with St. Louis City and, and it, for the launch of the MLS season you know, here in St. Louis, a new soccer club in St. Louis, and we wanted to do a, an event celebrating all things soccer, kind of the past, the present, and the future of all things soccer. And it, we, we looked at each other and said, now who at the MAC would be the member that could help pull together a great soccer crowd? And within one to two seconds, you know, we looked around and looked at each other and said, well, it's the Missouri Athletic Club Hall of Famer, Steve Krause.
You know, S Steve's been a member of the club for more than three decades. He served on the board and has been a driving force behind the city's support of soccer. He was the chairman of the Herman Trophy Award for 20 years and helped grow the event into the premier national awards banquet for soccer, college soccer. And locally, more than 25 years ago, Steve was instrumental in helping the MAC become the sponsor of the annual high school soccer all-star game. Steve was also a longtime club soccer coach, and some of his former players are, are in attendance tonight. All of this is to say Steve's dedication and passion and commitment to the sport have made a major positive impact on both the MAC and the local soccer community. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Steve Krause to introduce the rest of our speakers tonight. Steve. Thank you. Thank you. That was overdone, folks. Did way too much credit there. Uh, thank you for all being here this evening. I know there's a lot of other events tonight, uh, but this is an important night for St. Louis and St. Louis soccer and the MAC. Uh, as Steve alluded to, we've been supporting soccer for 30 plus years, and he said three decades. I think actually I'm a member for four decades. It's been that long. Uh, but Steve called me this summer and he said, hey, we've got this concept to do a, a soccer night for our speaker series. Uh, and the concept came together pretty quickly. Uh, let's do the history of soccer. We've got great people in town. And with the help of Jim Leaker and the St. Louis Soccer Hall of Fame, we can get some great folks here. Uh, we can lead and talk about our history and go into our future with the MLS. But the evening really needed one thing. It needed a master of ceremonies that could bridge our history and also can speak to our future, which is the MLS. And there really only, was only one person. Now, Joe Buck wasn't available for the event. So, <clears throat> no, no. <clears throat> no, I thought. Instantly, I thought there really is only one person, and that's that's Taylor Twelman. Uh, Taylor has bridged. Yeah. <laughs> Taylor truly has bridged our history with his family's history, and and the MLS. But actually, this isn't the first time Taylor's been on our stage before. So, back. Taylor. Taylor. <laughs> Woo. Taylor's first appearance was a Metro Player of the Year uh, at, at Slough High. And uh, I remember him showing up that evening. Oh, sorry. Slough. But, <laughs> but actually, it was a career at Slough that, that really almost didn't get started. It turns out that August, when everybody's gearing up for soccer tryouts, before Taylor's freshman year, he's playing in a golf tournament. As a matter of fact, He's leading the golf tournament and had just come off a great round when he finds out, oh, today was the first day of tryouts at SLU. Unbelievable. Taylor missed the first day. So it was a career that almost never happened at SLU High. <laughs> How'd you know I got that from Yeah. So I, I, guess the, I guess the clubs went away, and I guess he made the team because he wound up scoring over 100 goals in his career at, at, at SLU High. Uh, so, but also, it, it's, it's really how Taylor could then go into the MLS as a player and then as, as one of the main voices for the league that's important for us this evening. And I could recite a bunch of Taylor's cool statistics, of which there's plenty. But I remember talking to Taylor early on and I, th I think this is really kind of some of the kind of person that he is. I saw him playing in a, in a game down at Soccer Park, and it was in the playoffs, probably that semifinal weekend that most of us in this room have been to, where there's games going on all the different fields. And I happened to be on field three, and Taylor was going to be taking a PK. And so I go, I'm, I'm going to watch Taylor PK. So we've all seen the great goal scorers, great finishers in our lives, and they generally have a measured approach they have a spot that they peak, or now they kind of fake out the goalie. Taylor's 10 yards back, lining up for his kick, and I go, what the heck is he doing? He runs up in a sprint, hits a missile. I mean, it's, the, it's a missile over the goalie's head into the back of the goal before the goalie even can raise his hands. So after the game, I said, Taylor, you're a great goal scorer. You're a finisher. You know, what's your plan here? He goes, well, I'm going to hit it hard enough just in case if the goalie saves it, 
he's going to remember it, okay? <laughs> so with, with that kind of drive and determination, that's what got Taylor Twelman to be successful in the MLS, and we're going to watch a little bit of his success. And there it is! Immediately, Taylor Twelman! Please welcome Taylor Twalman. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Dad, I'll remember that golf story, so just keep in mind uh, where that story comes from. Um, it's really weird for me to be here tonight. Uh, life comes full circle, and I can see some of the kids sitting right down here. I was an 8, 9, 10-year-old that came here for the Mac Award, the Alexi Lawlesses of the world. We're celebrating the best that college soccer had to offer. This was the place to be in the late 80s and early 90s, St. Louis, Missouri, for honoring the best players. And as a kid, I used to come into this building, see the same carpet, oddly, um, <laughs> see the same bartenders. That's weird. This is weird. But um, Steve and the MAC, um, thank you. Uh, it is very uh, I get choked up thinking about it. Life comes full circle. It smacks you in the face when you least expect it. And um, St. Louis is going to be put on the map for what this city is going to do with St. Louis City. So it's great to be back. And so thank you. Before we get started, I'm going to get the accounting out of the way because Ty Keo reminded me six times at dinner he won the state championship. I did not win a state championship. Thank you, Brad Davis, for bringing it up. I didn't win. My dad and Ty Keel won at SLU seven overtimes. It was the greatest game ever. They beat Rosary uphill both ways in snow. I didn't win, so we got that out of the way. Unfortunately, Dan Flynn wasn't here. Otherwise, he could add uh, his two cents to it as well. Um, we got a great program for you tonight. And I think what many people don't understand is that we are on the precipice. We, and I say we even though I haven't been here for 21 plus years, we are on the precipice of putting St. Louis on the map internationally. But the greatest compliment I can give everyone in this room and what this city is, is look around these faces. Look at the speakers we have tonight. Every single generation represented this city to the highest of levels, and they did it out of respect for the game. They were ambassadors of the game, and you are gonna hear some unbelievable players but I'm gonna tell you something, more importantly, unbelievable people. And every generation tonight is gonna to be represented. How many cities in our country can say that with the sport of soccer? Not many. And I've lived it, and I've been gone, and I've seen it. And so this city, this room, thank you, and let's really cherish tonight for what the past is and what it was, but more so, and I'm gonna hold on to it to a little bit later, but let's motivate every single one of us in this room to make sure when the World Cup in 2026 shows up, this city is at the tip of the tongue of everybody else that wants to be a part of what St. Louis and soccer is about. And we are gonna use St. Louis City as that vehicle to do that. I, I think all of you would agree with me. I'm not so sure there's ever been a better time to be a soccer fan. How good was the World Cup that we just witnessed in November, December? Unbelievable. And I'm not going to name names, but there were TV executives of the highest order at said company that had the media rights that were worried that Michigan and Ohio State would outrate the World Cup. And then they saw the ratings and realized, oh, we missed the one by a lot. Soccer's here. There's no more lying about it. There's no more apologizing for it. Soccer is here. 
And it's here because finally St. Louis City is a part of it. When I listen to the Board of Governors of Major League Soccer, to the Board of Governors at U.S. Soccer, when I listen to the German clubs come over here and the English Premier Leagues come over here, for the last 15 years, everyone's been hearing me pontificating about how great St. Louis is, and you're not going to reach the pinnacle if St. Louis isn't part of the equation, and now it is here. And there is a moment in all of us right now where we've been watching the great videos, and I cannot believe they found a VHS tape of Al Trost and the St. Louis Stars, which, by the way, Al, this is the only place that still has a VCR, so good on them for finding it. But, like, that in and of itself tells you about the history of this place and how great this place is. We all remember what the 94 World Cup did for the men's game. And I'm sitting next to, to Lori Kolupny and what the 99 World Cup did for the women's game. This country, this country, and everyone at FIFA will tell you, takes the game to a level that it's never been. And in three and a half years, that men's World Cup is gonna be in the United States of America, Canada, and Mexico. And I don't think any of, you, any of us can honestly quantify what that's going to mean for the sport. But before I move on, Tim Ream and Josh Sargent represented this city and this country at the highest of state. <laughs> to see two players like that, shout out St. Dominic High School, even though the generations were different, doesn't matter. That in and of itself how all of us in this room had to be so proud of what this city was and what this represented and what it meant to the United States World Cup team that you had a 35-year-old center back and you had a young 22, 23, 24-year-old from St. Dominic High School playing at the highest of levels. That is what should motivate all of us to have the next Josh Sargent and the next Tim Ream represent this country in 2026. Before I move on to some of the guest speakers that we have, we have to give a round of applause to the Taylor family. It was 900, I think it was 900 and whatever, 10 concussions. As long as no one turns on the microphone, I won't pee myself. But it was 904 days ago that Carolyn Kindle looked me in the eye in Kansas City for a playoff game. And she said, I think I'm gonna pull it off. And I looked right at her, no, you're not. I've heard this story how many times? No, you're not. And she looked at me and said, nope, I think Uncle Andy and I are gonna pull this off. We're eight days before Bradley Carnell and St. Louis City play their first game in franchise history representing St. Louis City. And I think another round of applause for the Taylor and Kavanaugh family for pulling it off. The last thing I want to say, because obviously, as you guys know, I struggle to talk for a living, especially about myself. I'm often asked how to describe St. Louis and how to describe St. Louis players and what's different. I keep using the same words. Diligent, respectful, technical, well, minus me, Oops, sorry, team-oriented, but I'm gonna tell you the most important quality that I think St. Louis has over everything else because it continues to prove everyone wrong outside of St. Louis. Competitive. Every single player I played with, every single player I covered from this city, every single person in this room, I hope this city never loses it. The greatest two things I've got to do in my life, and my family's been here for a long, long time, my dad's family, the Twelmans, my mom's side of the family, the Delsings, two St. Louis families. But the two greatest things that I've got to do in my life and that I will accomplish comes from St. Louis, Missouri. I thought for the longest time, the most important thing I was going to do was score goals. And I thought everybody would talk about, yep, Taylor scored this number of goals or this was his batting average. But on August 30th, 2008, I got a concussion. And it ended my career and it changed my life forever. And yet this city taught me to be a man for others. This year, my foundation will have over 8 million kids take a Think Taylor pledge 
about taking ownership, responsibility, and empathy for anyone that gets a TBI while keeping the players, boys and girls, in the sport. This city gave that to me. So thank you. The other thing this city gave me is the game is, you are never bigger than the game. The game is always bigger than you. And everyone that you're gonna see talk up here tonight, I'm gonna pay them the best compliment right now in the world. Every single one of them, I'm telling you, they were unbelievable soccer players. Unbelievable soccer players. Altros, Ty Keel, Lori Kolopny, Brad Davis, Steve Trichu. Unbelievable, and yet there's a common theme with all of them. They are humble, and they are ambassadors of the game. And this city, this city made that. This city taught them that the game is bigger than you, and you give back to the game, and you show the game respect. And you're going to hear that common theme from everyone tonight. But it's about time somebody on the outside starts paying respect to St. Louis for what this city is about. Because what you guys have taught all of us, and I think I speak for all of us, is that the game, this city gave us the game that we all love. We love this game more than anything. We could sit here for hours and watch highlights and talk about the greatest Pattonville versus Oakville high school game or SLU versus Chaminade. We beat you, Brad. But the point is, the point is, we use our past. We love our past. We cherish our past. But everyone you hear talk to tonight, they are ambassadors of the game. I said two things this city gave me, a man for others and an ambassador. And the, most thing, the, the biggest thing in the world that I'm proud of is I represent you guys. I may have lived in Boston for 21 years, but I am St. Louis through and through. The Blues beat the Bruins, and I still remind Cam Neely every time I see him. But this city is amazing. You guys deserve it. Before I introduce the special guests, I do want to point out some very important people for where this game is going to go, this VIP table. But most importantly, I love where we are, but I am going to motivate the absolute hell out of every single one of you tonight that where we need to be in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, we need to be the most talked about city when it comes to Major League Soccer in St. Louis. Chris Roseman, president of Kirkwood United, VP at St. Louis Sports Commission, slice of board member. Thank you. Pat Berry, who ran St. Louis FC, plus uh, Scott Gallagher, president of Slicer, thank you. Chris Turin, Veta Sports, basically runs the facilities for the Spanos family. Thank you, Jim Leaker. Thank you. Congrats on winning the Masters. <laughs> Johan Arneson, I think, the executive director of Slicer, thank you. Mike Dean, incoming president of MISA, thank you very much. Dan Flynn, who couldn't be here, who has represented St. Louis to the highest of his abilities, former CEO and Secretary General of U.S. Soccer, and yes, who wrote this for me? He won the state championship with Ty Keel and Tim Twoman at St. Louis U. High in 1973. Uh, Bill McDermott, his back went out. He's Mr. Soccer, as Bob Costas called him, but more importantly, for those of you that know Bill McDermott, he took all my grandfather's money at Norwood Hills. Sandbagger. Dave Lang, where are you? There you are, buddy. Author of Soccer Made in St. Louis, and for those of you that don't know, the second edition is available now, correct? Right, there's pictures of me all through the book, or no? That's the only reason why I'm promoting it right now. But if you haven't read it, it is an unbelievable book, and for those of you that are in this room that aren't from St. Louis, Read the book, you'll get up to speed very quickly about the history of St. Louis and what it's done. Each one of you in your own way have been great for the city, great for the game, but more so what we're gonna do in the future, every single one of you is gonna be a huge part of that, so thank you. So now for our guest speakers. See, I gotta write it down, concussions, I forgot. Uh, it's interesting how Brad Davis put himself first. <clears throat> All right, here we go. So we're gonna do pictures together. Where's the run of show? Hang on. There it is, right there. Got it. All right, so Brad Davis, here we go. Come on up, brother. High School Chaminade. <laughs> High School Chaminade, St. Louis University. Listen to these numbers. 
played in 392 matches. 392? 123 assists, which is third most ever in Major League Soccer. Ironically, second is fellow St. Louis and Steve Ralston. You wrote this too. Two-time winner of MLS Cup. Okay, whatever. <laughs> you guys don't know, Brad Davis won two MLS Cups against me. <laughs> you said it, buddy. Yep. 17 caps with the U.S. men's national team. And for those of you in the room, one of the highlights of my broadcasting career was calling Brad Davis against Germany in the World Cup representing Chaminade and St. Louis University. That was a fantastic moment for me. And he's also the first player in MLS and U.S. soccer history from the Yoda family. <laughs> Just making sure we're paying attention to the ears. Okay, Brad Davis, everybody. <laughs> Steve Trichu, Granite City North, SIU Edwardsville, and this is a story that he's gonna tell tonight that is fantastic. One of the best ambassadors and gentlemen I've ever met. 317 professional games. He also played indoor and outdoor, including the Steamers in the Ambush. A member of the 1990 World Cup team. He made 37 appearances with the U.S. men's national team. And a story that we're going to get into, but he is an answer to a trivia question that everyone gets wrong on TV. He played in Prague and in Holland. He is the first American to play in Champions League. And back then it was called European Cup. Steve Trichu. I wish I was half as good as the next one. Lori Kolopny, come on up here. Nearinx. North Carolina, I mean, this is insane. 106 caps, 10 goals with the U.S. Women's National Team, gold medal in the 2008 Olympics, and a member of the 2015 World Cup winning team. She played and thrived at North Carolina, which in and of itself is an accomplishment. She won a title in 2003, 30 goals, 32 assists. She played professionally for the Athletica and is currently the head coach at Maryville University. Lori Kolopny. <laughs> Ty Keough, St. Louis University High School, college St. Louis University. And before I get into this playing career, it was an amazing thing for me to come back from Germany playing MLS and in my first game that was nationally televised, the first person I see at my training was Ty Keel. It was the coolest experience ever. Four-time All-American at SLU. He played professionally for the Steamers. He was actually at the game that Altros played in that we just watched eating dinner. He played eight times for the U.S. men's national team, but one of the best things about Ty Keel is his ambassador of the game post-playing career. He coached at Washington University and was an unbelievable soccer broadcaster for over 12 years. Ty Keel. <laughs> Al Trost, high school St. Louis Prep, college St. Louis University, a member of the National Soccer Hall of Fame, two-time Herman Trophy winner, 69 and 70. Let me say that again, a member of the National Soccer Hall of Fame. That's a round of applause in itself. He was captain of the U.S. men's national team in the 70s. He played for the St. Louis Stars. You guys know this. But I learned something that I didn't know, even though I lived maybe a half of a mile away from him, that he won the state title for McClure North and was the coach at Parkway South for 20, 25 years. Al Trost. <laughs> so, Al, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you. Um, when you, when you were playing, there were little pockets of the game in this country where everyone talked about it, but the media coverage wasn't there. But everyone kind of knew in the, in the mid to late 60s, St. Louis is doing something different that everyone else is in soccer. What was it like back then? And I'm not trying to date you, but I'm, in all seriousness, what was it? Because there was such a humility to you post-playing but I feel like you still would slide tackle any one of us on this stage right now. You were competitive. What was it like back then? I hated to lose. Yeah. I did yeah. hate to lose. Um, well, like, like everybody in my era and, and the older folks here know, the seniors know that, you know, the soccer really grew up in St. Louis was on the CYC and the CYO programs. Um, 
I was fortunate enough to have five older brothers involved in the game. My dad was a coach, um, and I grew up following those guys around uh, and uh, in North St. Louis, uh, not far from Fairgrounds Park. Um, and from there, I went out to uh, St. Philip near I, CYC program, uh, Coach Dave Berwin. And, and um, mm -hmm. you know, I grew up with a great bunch of players. You know, many of them become All-Americans, and Ty played against some of them. And um, it, it, it was just a, a great community-orientated game. I and mean, we hated to lose against the Southsiders. You yeah. know, we were competitive. <laughs> I told you, it's still, still a thing. thing. It's still a thing. <laughs> Ty, in all seriousness, you didn't follow that. You were soon thereafter with Al at St. Louis University, right? And you came from St. Louis University High. Your dad was a big name in this. And yet you came in and you really carried the torch at a difficult time, I think, for Americans. I think Al would attribute to this when you were trying to play at the next level. What did it mean for you when you represented the U.S. and more so represented St. Louis at the highest of levels? Well, I like to rub it in with both Bill McDermott and Al <laughs> Tros that I watched them play a lot when I was 9 or 10 years old, when my dad took yep. over the St. Louis University program. <laughs> but, uh, but to represent your country is something that uh, you could do in a few sports, but I don't know if you can really do it to the same degree and in the same character that you do in the world of soccer. It is the world sport. And if you put on the USA jersey, as these folks have all done, uh, you dream about that. I dreamt about it when I was four or five years old because my dad had played in the 1950 World Cup. My dad had played and was the captain of the 52 and 56 uh, US Olympic teams. Uh, so I had this uh, dream the whole time. And I knew what it meant, too. Uh, we would go, uh, my mother's from Mexico, so we would go uh, to Mexico many summers, uh, including the summer of the 70 World Cup. And uh, so I got to see Pelé play and Brazil, that legendary team, in all six of their matches in the 70 World Cup. So I understood what the world meant uh, in terms of the world's game. Uh, the soccer that was played all around the world and how much Brazil 1970 meant. And so, so to be able to then step onto that stage and represent my country, you can't beat that. Something very close to that, which I did get to do, was play as a professional in my hometown with the St. Louis Steamers. So it, if you're a professional athlete or if, if you get to be a top-level athlete, Al got to do it too, what's, what's better than that? Play as a professional in your hometown and represent your country. Those are, those are the two ultimate things that you shoot for. In, in fact, I had, a, I had a chance to go along with what Ty said. Um, when I came out of St. Louis University, I had a, a chance to go professional then, but I, fortunately I made the Olympic team. And in my day, representing the country on the Olympic team yep. was the most important thing. Yep. I don't care how much money, or yep. they weren't, they weren't going to pay us very much anyway, but... Uh, <laughs> But I w delayed that so I could represent this country, and it's the most important thing in my life. How good was your goal against Poland? It, it was, uh, I was... I, I mean, there's no record of it, so I'm just... You could say whatever you want to say. No one's going to well, care. At, at home, I have two VCRs. Okay. <laughs> hey, but at, Al, you should, you should mention, that was the Munich Olympics, and you guys were in the Olympic Village when some really serious yeah. stuff happened. Yeah, that, that, that was an unfortunate event, you know. Uh, fortunately for us, we were, well, unfortunately, we were eliminated right before that happened. So a lot of us were out of the village and not, not around, but it happened right next to our dorm. Um, but that's, that's something that, you know, we'll never forget. Tragic. Yeah, I, I appreciate, though, Ty, you talking about it, because that is what about tonight is, about St. Louis City. And Brad and I have texted each other numerous amount of times what we would do to go back and play in that city park and represent this city. You guys did it with the steamers and whether it's the ambush, whether it's the stars, like all of that. And yet August, let me get the date right. August 4, 2015, the U.S. Women's National Team played New Zealand and someone scored a goal. How cool was that? Honestly, Lori. That was fun. That was what, a fun Was day. that yeah. like, like when you tell your kids and your players, would you say top three moments? 
Top moment. Top moment personally for me. Yeah. yeah. What, what was it like, though? Because all of us want to know what it's like to play. I mean, in just to play at Bush Stadium. You yeah. know, the, here comes the national team, and I'm, I'm back on the team in 2015, and, and we're going to play here in St. Louis, and we're going to play at Bush Stadium. And I'm like, you know, for – St. Louisans, that's a, oh, that's, that, that's a big deal, you know? Um, so just to step on that field and to be in those locker rooms, and it was, it was a big moment for me. Um, but got uh, into the game uh, late in the second half. I think it was tied. Uh, I, I, think, I think it was the, the go-ahead goal. Or it was. Uh, Don't worry about it. You can, so, by the way, you're done I, playing. I, I, you I can, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, can brag right. about I, whatever I forget, you want. I forget. Remind me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, no, that, the, for, for me personally, that was the highlight of my career. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was pretty pretty special. I mean, you know, you've got you've got friends and family there. You've got I've got old coaches there. I've got old teammates there. You know, it was it was a special moment. Ex boyfriend, sorry, <laughs> I was just kidding. They were not there. They were not there. So, I was just kidding. So Laura, just kidding. Laura, you have that on DVD. Yeah, that that one. Yeah, there's right. a thing called DVD. It's it's Blu-ray actually. So, so th this is really cool because I, I I happen to be in a nice box watching this game, and there were over thirty five thousand people at Bush Stadium, and which was breathtaking to, to see that level of play and see your goal was not uh, just was, an average goal; it was, it was a pretty it was awesome amazing. goal. And it's on DVD. You can buy that after, yeah. afterwards here. <laughs> but but I was sitting next to Bobby Kehoe and Pete Sorber, and I turned around to them around the time of your goal, looked at. Almost 36,000 people in Bush Stadium watching the women's national team beat New Zealand. And Laurie Kolopny, our hometown gal, scored a great goal. And I said to Pete and I said to Bobby Kehoe, can you even believe this is happening? No. I mean, when you, when you think back to the, the 60s and 70s Absolutely. and everything that happened in this city in terms of the growth of soccer, to come back and, and see something like that, that was fantastic. Yeah, you know, and, and like Taylor was talking about earlier, it's, it's, uh, this city is is special it's different um and to to score a goal like that on that stage but it didn't feel like it was for me it felt uh i just felt so appreciative of everybody well there you know of all the coaches of all the the people who had been there for me from day one and and who had you know been through the blood sweat and tears so yep. it, it it felt like that the goal was for the city uh yep. and, and for every everything that they've done well said well said steve you and i uh we met in 2000 at yeah. Hofbrau House, yeah. we, dad, dad, I was, dad, I, over there under 21, you can drink. It's okay. It's totally fine. Yeah, and he was drinking too. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, nothing's changed. Middle of Munich. But, but Steve, I'm a, this crowd doesn't know this, and I, and I need to set it up right, because many of people, and Steve's going to laugh at this, the 94 World Cup team thinks soccer started with them, and I've invited all of them to come here and enjoy the history of St. Louis soccer because it's over 70 years, and Alexi Lalas is listening, so I know he's listening, but the 90 World Cup, and a lot of us don't remember it because it wasn't, we didn't have the media access that we have, but the 1990 World Cup, the United States played Czechoslovakia, and there was a player that came off and had the game of his life, played really well, Steve's going to tell me it wasn't, it was, because I've asked people that were there. And the assistant coach of Czechoslovakia says, we're going to sign an American to go play for Sparta Prague in the Champions League where they just left the old Soviet Union. So I'm going to say that one more time. This man right here went and played in Prague, Czechoslovakia when they just left, right? Am I got that right? They just yeah. left the Soviet yeah, Union. 89. And as American went there, they won the league and he became the first American to play in the Champions League. My man, I want to hear stories. Yeah, thanks. I honestly, Steve, go back to that. What? First off, what the hell were you thinking? And secondly, so here, here's what I was thinking. So, yeah. So, he, actually, he just didn't see me in that game. So he was one of the scouts for Czechoslovakia at the time, and so they had, they had, um, you know, they, they after, after I got back from the World Cup, they contacted. Um, U.S. Soccer, because we were owned by U.S. Soccer at the time. Because people don't remember that. We were, we were on full-time contracts through U.S. Soccer. And so um, they contacted them. I had a few tryouts lined up to go over, but um, this was like, here's a contract, let's come. And I didn't know anything about Czechoslovakia, to tell you the truth. They have great beer, though. People that have been there, unbelievable. <laughs> I've so, been, so by the way, yeah, so by the way, I've been to Prague. Oh, I'm sure you didn't have a tough time. No, not at all. But no, it was it was something that um, 
I didn't really think about it a whole lot. It was just like, you know, I wanted to go to Europe. That was one of my, my main things I wanted to do. And um, it was a great opportunity for me. And so, and really when, when they, when they, when they, when I signed the contract, I had no idea <laughs> they were in the champ or it was a champions league now, the European cup back then. And so I had no idea that it, that was even part of it. Um, so I get over there and everything starts happening. I mean, we're playing games and then, um, you know, the games come up, we play Spartak Moscow. Back then it was even home and away, you know, and so we played them at our place, um, got beat 2-0, and then we went to Russia in front of, it was like 70,000 to 80,000 people in, in the uh, in the city. Some there. granite city Illinois kids yeah. playing right back. Yeah, right. What so, the? Hey, what not, the? But no, it and was, it's not it was, like he made the decision to go there to play champions. Like he just said, <laughs> I had no idea they were in it. It was so, it, no, but it was it was a great experience. By the way, I mean, if you lose, we get your passport. Sorry. You, you never know. I mean, some of those guys were like, they were scared of the, the communism still at that, at that time. You think? You know, and so, <laughs> yeah, because they slumped someone spoke Russian, but like, no, because I was like the first foreigner there in 50 years. Um, yep. And so, but it was it was a great experience. Um, I still keep in contact with guys from, from, from Sparta uh, to this day. And so, but yeah, like, Great experience. I mean, it's amazing, though, Steve, because, like, we watched Tyler Adams, Weston McKinney, Christian Pulisic, all these players doing it, and yet when I had one of my real good friends at ESPN and I said, find me something, and he goes, buddy, everyone's been getting this wrong. Steve Trichy is the first American to ever play the Champions League. I'm like, oh, that is gold. Yeah, there you go. It's perfect. That no. is gold. No, and then I, mean, I said, wait, could... where did he play? Yeah, I mean, we were, you know, I was one of the first. I mean, Caligiuri had been over there, yeah. I think. Peter Vermees Peter was, Vermees over, was there. over there. There were there were players um, over there, but not yeah. Not, not, not many, and so it was not in Prague, Czechoslovakia, no, buddy. But, but even there, you know, they don't want foreigners there. No, and so I get the crap kicked out of me every day. But um, that was how I learned a lot, and so it was. It was like I said, it was. It was a learning experience on and off the field, trying trying to live through that at, at times. But because uh, it's not like you can go to a store at at ten o'clock at night. There's nothing open, <laughs> you know. So it was. You're it, behind it was, the iron curtain. It <laughs> was the iron curtain, yeah. So, but no, it's. It, Beautiful city and beautiful people, and um, it was one of the best times of my life. Oh, so, I bet. Let, let me highlight that 90 World Cup because Steve played in the 90 World Cup. It was played in Italy. The United States had not played in a World Cup for 40 years. Yeah, because you and Al sucked. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, what were you got like? What were you guys doing? Well, hey, do you, remember this: How many teams will qualify for the 2026 <laughs> World Cup? Uh, what is it? 48. 48. It's 48 now. Well, yeah, but how, it, it might how, go how many to How many teams uh, qualified? In the 70s, when yeah. I played, it was 16. 16. 16. So a little One tougher, a from CONCACAF. Yep. And you guys sucked. But, but I want. We almost made it. <laughs> and everybody knows, about the five, everybody knows about the five St. Louis guys that played in 1950. So you're on the 90 team in Italy, represented the United States in a World Cup. And I want you to tell a story that you told me once. You'll, you'll remember this about how you were going to approach the first game against Czechoslovakia and how the United States was going to impose its will physically on the Czechs, and you're standing in the tunnel before the game. And, and Thomas Skaravi, what was he, 6'6"? Six, oh, six, 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 no, he was like 6'5". That guy was yeah. huge, yeah. Was Tell six, me the story, though. It's yeah, great. So, you know, so obviously we qualify for the World Cup first time in – 50 years, we're 40, 40 years, we're there. Um, and so, you know, we're watching, we're watching video leading up to it. Bob Gansler is our coach on VHS, by the way. So there's a lot of stopping and rewinding and things like that. But, um, you know, our game plan was like, we can play with these guys, we can beat these guys. And so we get there and, and it was, I'm, I'm standing there with Tab because it was an underground tunnel that you go up to the, up to the field and, and, and they'll introduce you or whatever um, for that national anthems. And I'm standing there, we're all standing there, and these guys are like huge. And we're like, oh no. <laughs> so, and that game didn't turn out very well. So. Yeah. The, the VHS didn't show 6'3. It, it didn't. No, it was, it was it, was like 6'5, yeah. and they had at least six, seven other guys who were 6'3 well, or 6'4. Yeah, six, because four. Because I got to know a lot of those guys are my, my teammates at Sparta Prague, and so I got to know these guys. And they actually they were very complimentary towards us, um, saying, yeah, we thought you guys were going to give us a really good game too. Obviously, we didn't. But, but, uh, but they, you know, they thought they were in for a game. But we what, thought you were going to be good, but we won five one. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that was it. Yeah. I was about 11 years old. Um, 
and I and for those of you who don't know, I played soccer, obviously, but I played way more baseball and I played a ton of basketball. I loved all sports, but I was at a at a practice and I was 11, 11 or 12. Pat Noonan, another St. Louis and coach of FC Cincinnati, and I remember this to this day. And they were talking about a kid that was a year behind us at Scott Gallagher, and he only used his left foot, and he could literally fly away with his ears if he wanted to. <laughs> Listen, bro. <laughs> when I talk about Brad Davis, and I mean this, we all knew at 12 the kid was different. But the coolest part about Brad Davis is if Brad Davis was playing now in 2023, he'd be the perfect first academy player to literally go through the system and represent St. Louis City. He was the best player at Scott Gallagher. He was the best player Chaminade had ever seen. He was one of the best players St. Louis University had ever had. And everything he did, he represented. And I knew this because I basically am 11 months older than him. He represented the city first and foremost. Anyone that asked him anything, nope, St. Louis Cardinals, St. Louis Blues, nothing else, you're an idiot, shut up about anything else. It was St. Louis, and it was St. Louis only. But people forget your brother was a good player. Your brother was a real good player. He was decent. He was decent. <laughs> and I think you'd be the perfect person for me to ask this, because now we're in the present and the future. The generations in St. Louis passed the game down every single time. You were an example of that with your brother, it, what was it like growing up with your brother Jeff, but then also going through everything you did, Gallagher, Chaminade, St. Louis U, it was about putting St. Louis on the map. How important was that to you? It was, uh, it was massive. Um, you know, as, as each one of these members have said, I mean, in, in Lori scoring, scoring the goal, and she said the biggest thing yep. was being here in St. Louis, yep. and, you know, in, in front of my family. It's, uh, we're a small-knit community. Um, everywhere that uh, we've gone and we've played, the, the, the first thing that you hear, oh, another St. Louis guy. Yep. Another St. Louis player. Yep. You know, and we find each other really quick. Yeah, um, we do. Uh, around the league. So to be able to have that. But, I mean, growing up here in St. Louis with soccer, it was, it was easy. It wasn't necessarily forced upon you. There, there was always a game going on. Yep. Right? You were always uh, on the sidelines playing. You know, my brother's 10 years older than me, so playing with, uh, yep. playing with his buddies, them kicking the absolute crap out of me all the time. And yes, and he was, he is 10 Nine and a half years older than you. He's on, he's on, he's on VHS as well. <laughs> um, no, but uh, that, was a, that was a huge thing, being able to, to, to grow up. The other thing, Taylor, growing up is, you know, um, and seeing this stuff is we didn't, the league wasn't here. Yep. Right? So yep. as, as we come through, your aspirations and your, your outlook on things are a little bit different. We didn't have the league. The only opportunities that we had were in Europe. Yep. So really the, the focus wasn't about I want to be a professional. It was just we played because we loved the game. Bingo. Bingo. played because we loved the game. We didn't really have the aspirations to go to Europe when we were younger because it just wasn't, it wasn't that type of mentality. Our parents didn't know that. We were educational based and, you know, going and, and, and coming through that process. So you played because you loved the game. Yep. It was, yep. not, it was not forced upon you. So being able to go through those experiences, I think that was a massive thing. Being able to, you know, chase these guys around and run around and kick the crap out of you. You learn yep. real quick how to play the game a lot faster. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, you, one of the, main things but one, but one compete. of the biggest compliments I could give you and this group should hear is that you continuously, even though you never kicked the ball with your right foot and everyone in the world knew you were left footed. It's because I got grounded if I did. But you, yeah, but you still evolved. You made the World Cup in the twilight of your career, Brad. You continuously played at a high level when you got older. 15 years is one hell of a, a career. Almost 400 games played. Like, when you say that, that's a tribute to the kind of player you were. But playing against Germany in a World Cup? Come on, it doesn't get better than that, does it? No. No. <laughs> no, and that's, uh, honestly, that's... that's what do you remember there. about the day, if anything? The, Besides the, the great commentary that you heard when you got home and listened to the game. I actually watched the game in mute. <laughs> <laughs> hey, by the way, that reason, so did everybody else in the room. Reason, exactly. <laughs> um, no, honestly, the, the, the biggest thing that uh, I remember, it was like once the game starts, once it kicks off, it's another game. You're in it, right? So uh, you, rem you remember moments and bits and, and pieces, obviously. But, you know, the biggest thing for me when people ask me this question is, is, is I always told myself when I got the opportunity, if I, if I was able to stand out, at the beginning of the game and the national anthem goes off for the United States of America, yeah. don't forget where you came from. Take a moment to enjoy it. Yeah. Look around, take a breath, remember all your experiences, remember your family, remember who you're representing. 
you're not there for you. You're yep. there for a lot bigger picture. And that was one of the biggest things that I took from the entirety of the World Cup was being able to stand there out on the field. Yeah, it was well awesome. It was fun being there. To be able to, to have that moment. Brad, you were, you were playing for a German coach, the I U.S. Was. national team. Yeah, what, what kind of experience was that to play for a German coach? Be careful, against, Brad. This, someone's always German. listening. Lutz, is, Lutz, is Lutz listening? Uh, yeah, I mean, basically, there's a, there's a German flavor, obviously, to the approach of St. Louis City now. Uh, so I mean, I'm inter interested in your perspective in, in terms of what you learned from Jurgen Klinsmann, uh, what, what he liked about your play, obviously. This, we're talking now style of play, really. St. Louis style of play, German style of play, how City expects to be able to play in Major League Soccer. So one of the, one of the biggest things, this was uh, always uh, weird, I guess, to, to yep. think about, but... I always had really good success with international coaches. Yep, yep. Uh, the American coaches weren't a big fan. To be totally honest, it just didn't, it never worked out. When, you know, uh, Bruce Arena was there. I got to go to a Gold Cup. We had success 2005. Yep. We won the Gold Cup yep. with him. But then uh, Bob Bradley was there. Never why, really. Why do, you, why do you think that was, maybe? I, I have a thought on that, but go ahead. You know, for, for me, I was uh, a thinker of the game. I wasn't the biggest, I wasn't the fastest, I wasn't the strongest. I think when it comes to American soccer and American coaches, a lot of times we think about just athletes. I, th this game obviously up here, is, 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 as we all know, this is, uh, it's, it's not just about the physical attributes, it's about the mental attributes. And to Taylor's point about playing, being able to play for 15 years and have longevity within your career, it's, it's con constantly how can you continue to evolve? How can you continue to adapt? How can you think the game versus as your body gets older and you break down, you have to figure out ways to play the game a lot smarter versus strictly rely on your athletic right. ability. And, and, and I'm going to just highlight one particular aspect of soccer, and that is passing, passing the ball. Uh, because we all grew up, how much emphasis did we have on passing the ball? I mean, every Speak practice. Speak for yourself, Ty. I never I just, passed. I well, you, your, jo your job was to not pass. Your job yeah, was to, no, you know, no, your job was was to not pass passing. it to the back Every of the assist I ever had was yeah. a shot that got deflected. <laughs> I am being 100% honest. If well, you took <laughs> more than two touches, it was a counterattack. <laughs> right, I'm not really kidding. <laughs> you're the exception that proves the rule. But St. Louis soccer was always based on passing. I mean, every practice was two touch, one touch passing That's for sure. That's how going, technical ability. Yeah, technical ability. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact is, in terms of St. Louis style of play, it's interesting what's being emphasized here for St. Louis City, this pressure, counter pressure, constant pushing into playing a high line. It's the way we grew up. We, we always pressured all over the field. And we also passed the ball, maybe to a fault. Uh, we didn't have enough guys doing the individualistic stuff like, like you, you excelled in. <laughs> yeah, in terms I don't, of the, I'm, I'll own it. Yep. Yeah. No, I'm just saying. Well, that's it's not no, about me. Do, I'm not playing. Why do goal scorers get the big money? Right? Look at right. the size They're, of his head. <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> oh, spe speaking of, the, uh, but, of his head. So when I, was his, when I was his dad's teammate, Bradley, you'll like this as well. This is a trivia question. What three players, two of them are in this room, played their last season as professionals in 1986? And you'll know one of them because he played in a World Cup final in 1974. And that was Johan Naiskins. So Naiskins, Tim Twelman, and myself were with the Kansas City Comets. And Taylor would come into the locker room after the games. And he already had the massive cranium. It was like Sputnik. I mean, it was it was like an orange on a toothpick. But he, what, what were you like? Seven, he's like seven years old, six or seven years old, and he would be handing the beers really out to all the guys in the, in the locker room after the game. It was awesome. Now I just do squats. Uh, Lori, I want to bring it back to St. Louis because I paid every single one of you a compliment because you all, in your own way, have been ambassadors of the game and you're spreading what the game is about, and the love for the game, and you can hear it when they talk, but Lori, you've now been a coach for what, 10 plus years? Yeah, right? 10 years, yeah. I, I'm just curious from your perspective, because at the highest of levels, you did it and you won at the women's game. What's changed about St. Louis, the players? Like what, what has changed from when you were growing up? Like, like, cause I see what I see around our country and Steve and I were talking about this at dinner, just the exposure to the game. Any one of us can watch any game in the world right now. We're like, we fought for, Bundesliga Sunday or whatever we need, like we couldn't get that. I'm just curious from your point of view, where has it changed in this city? 
if at all. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And I think even even more so maybe on the women's side of the game um, because we didn't, I mean, I, I never watched a women's game growing up ever. I mean, I couldn't, you know, there wasn't such a thing. Um, and so all of my role models and everybody I looked up to were, were male soccer players, male, you know, Car St. Louis Cardinals players. But but um, I didn't have the female role models that uh, our, our young female players are fortunate to have. Who's now. your favorite so, male soccer player? I'm just curious. Uh, Paul Scholes. Scholesy. Yep. Loves, loved Dr. Yep. Scholesy. We should move on. I was, was kind of hoping it, she said me. <laughs> it was the, the red I only red. asked it, Steve because I thought she was going to say me. Gosh darn it. <laughs> no, but it, it, where, where has it changed, though, for you, if you had to pinpoint one thing? Because I, I saw it a couple times seeing the academy train at St. Louis City. I can see it with what Brad and Steve are doing with Gallagher, what Lou Fuse is doing. What it Just every aspect of soccer in this city is kind of done the right way because it's done for the love of the game. I'm just curious, though, has the exposure to the sport made it different than when we grew up? I don't know. I mean, yep. I, I don't know. Um, I it's kind of refreshing. Yeah, it's 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 the same game. Um, but, you know, obviously it's it's advanced. I mean, you know, you go watch kids now 10 years old and I'm like, geez, uh, uh, you know, skill wise and just tech technicality is, is, is so much more advanced. But I mean, it's the same game. It's the that's what's great about it. Right. Is that, yep. you know, we can watch these games of on VHS uh, of Altros and, it, and it's and it's the same game and it's the same game that we love and while it changes a little bit here and there it's, it's, it's still soccer. the same game yeah. al where's the change for me i'm just curious no, I, I i just think there's so many good coaches now either old players or coaching the the women's game right now yep especially on the collegiate level like anson dorrance and you know yep. guys that he he coach coached yep. you know now are coaching i think there's so much um, exposure to that type of coaching it's making yep. the women's game better. Al, was there ever a time when you were at Parkway South when you were coaching, though, and I mean this seriously, where you saw a player or a moment and you're like, wow, this game is different than when I played? Or was it just better athletes, for lack of a better phrase, to come up with? Was there anything that you saw as a coach? Because you did it for 25 years. Well, as you, as you, um, in teaching and coaching in high schools, there's only two months of the year. Yep. So you know right away, this player has played more than two months of the year. Yep. You know, he's getting coaching beyond that and those players really showed up you know unfortunately the public school system you get everybody so yeah you know it, it's hard to work that so in. why was your history class at parkway south the most attended history class in history was it all about the world cup or what was it because <laughs> i i well, passed around and everyone said out the, the vcr <laughs> and set the vcr up you know and then we were ready to go but with laurie i do camps with laurie yep. during the summer at maryville and I'll tell you what, she, uh, one day of the week, you know, she'll bring out her gold medal and she'll sign autographs for every single camper. I mean, it shows up. Yep. I mean, that's why the women's game is where it is. Yep, it absolutely it is. Can I add to that? Uh, absolutely, you so, can. So I, I see it, it, it's absolutely changed, you know, and, and, and now, I mean, when you really, when you really look at this, uh, th this panel sitting up here, we have another one. Dan Donigan's back there. He's now he's St. Louis University yep. coach back. He, yep. He's now at St. Louis Development Academy. But you look at the people that have gone on to have great careers that are wanting to come back to St. Louis to be able to yep. give back. Yep. It's to the point. community. Very good to point. The young, to the young players. So when you talk about the the, the coaching, you have you have folks that have played at the highest level. You have folks that have humbled themselves and really love this city and want to give back, want to continue to drive yep. it. You know, you talk about Reamer and Sargent. Um, right now, you talk about this generation right here. I would absolutely say, you know, now the formation of St. Louis City coming coming into to this market now, it's absolutely changed from the grassroots level. Yep. People have really started to take um, a focus on it, even from the from the women's uh, aspect of things. You know, you see the NWSL now, and in in those teams, and uh, you know, you have your um, MLS teams and your NWSL teams combined mm -hmm. together with MLS yep. and and things like that. So I, I absolutely can see a, a change in the kids' mentality and their thought process yep. because now they have something that actually is attainable. They yep. can see it, they absolutely. can feel it, they can taste it, and where where this is going now is absolutely absolutely different and to your point about how this is going to be a massive game changer for the city of st louis we've been fortunate to be able to continue to have people represent st louis on a on a world stage on an international stage i think it's only going to get better yeah i agree you, the pipeline is absolutely still there the foundational 
being of what we're of what we're doing, what we're teaching, those things are still there. The blue collar work of compete is still there. So I only see it getting yep. even 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 bigger and even better. But Steve, it's absolutely I'm, changed. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to you before we bring Bradley up here and, and celebrate what is the beginning of something very special. But Steve, your career is it was one hell of a playing career, but my man, you've put in some real work on the coaching side. And you played in MLS six seasons. Did I got that right? Or is it seven? Six? Six, yeah. Six seasons. And that was at a time when this thing was riding the wave of the 94 World Cup and hosting the World Cup. We've got the 26 World Cup coming. And yet the infrastructure here is exponentially different than what it was in 94. When you put your, I want you to put your coach's hat on now. Where's the league changed? Where Where is the league grown? I don't want you to say stadiums because we all know yeah. that. We see the billion dollar complex right downtown St. Louis. Like, but playing wise, like for the people out here that don't know what MLS is about, how would you answer that question? Yeah, so I mean, I was fortunate. You know, I retired in 2001. Um, and then actually since then I've been all levels. I mean, youth, um, academy, MLS academies, our academy now. Um, MLS assistant coach, USL coach, thank you, Pat, <laughs> except for one year, whatever. No, but um, <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> no, so, no, so I, I mean, I've seen it all. Yep. And I've, see, I've seen the game grow. Um, and not, not just on the youth level. And I, we're talking about the youth level. I mean, now we see kids. I mean, you know, I, I see kids in our, our youth academy, nine, eight, nine, 10, 11. These kids are unbelievable. I mean, there's kids back when we were growing up. There's no way these kids are going to know that amount of amount of the game, you know. And so, just technical ability, and you know, the the, the the tactical part of the game too. They understand the game a little bit more. And so, and then to see the game grow, you know, in in our academy, uh, well, just the MLS and the and the elite academy, we'll call it that. I mean, it's just immense. I mean, the competition in that is it's like a very high level right now. But to see but to see the game grow from the MLS level. You know, because, you know, I was, it was towards the end of my career. So the first year of the league's 96 is when I came in with, with, in Colorado. Then it ended up. When you got your passport back from Czechoslovakia. Yeah, they, they finally got it back. So I came back. No, but then, you know, then I ended up in Tampa, uh, finishing off my career there. Um, but I, I wanted to stay in the game. But just, just to see the game as, as at the MLS grow from 96 to where it is now, I mean, it's like night and day. Um, and you know we talk about the stadiums, but I think I think the stadiums and the atmosphere have a lot to do with that. You know, yep. back then, you know, yep. I give you an example in, in in Colorado. We you know we play at Mile High, and that's how many 80,000 people, and we'd get twenty thousand people. It just didn't. It, it wasn't the same atmosphere as it is now. But to see like I guess it was ninety nine, the first uh, in Columbus, the first soccer specific stadium we had. You know, we were talking about it earlier. Yep. I mean, back then it was like, wow, this place is unbelievable, and now. You know, their academy plays in that thing. <laughs> so, and I mean, just the way that that has grown just from just from, uh, you know, a, a, a growth of the league and the, the soccer specific stadiums. But the, the level of play, um, you know, the bring I mean, back then, you know, we had we had the Valderramas, which I, I was fortunate to play with him. And he was unbelievable. You know, there were there were a few other players um, that that came came over. But to see these players now and not just the not just the older ones, but the younger ones that are coming in that they're able to afford it. Well, Steve, I mean, to your point, for the first time, a World Cup champion had a live right. MLS player right. on the roster in Tiago Amato. Yeah, for sure. And it then, took 27 years yeah. to do that, which a lot of us, because we're American and we want to go from zero to 100 in five years. I'm going to say that again. There's an Argentine player that won a World Cup that is playing in Major League Soccer currently, and he's under 26 years old. It's never happened. And so that's the growth that I see, and I think it's remarkable to see that it's happened in less than 30 years. Yeah, I mean, I see the growth of the, 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 the play on the field, though. Yep. I mean, the, this, the, the growth of the game on the field is much – it's, it's different. way higher. Than, it's, it's a lot different. It's I mean, different. The game, the game is it's quicker, it's more technical, and so um, – and it's exciting for the fans for sure. Yep. Brad Davis, Steve Trichu, Lori Kolepny, Ty Keo, Altros, thank you very much. I am one. I went to the wrong church. <laughs>
all great custodians of the game, ambassadors of the game, and before we get into Bradley Carnell, Kevin Kaler, St. Louis University, raise your hand. Well done, my man. Just saw you. Another great ambassador of the game and someone that still owes me my right shin from high school. Um, before we talk to Bradley Carnell, I've gotten to know Bradley. Um, we have some mutual uh, people in our playing careers in Germany. Um, one of the great gentlemen of the game, but someone that has a real passion to put this city on the map and to use St. Louis City to do that. But before I bring Bradley up here, this is the part where I look at all of you and I'm gonna give you a quote. If you dwell in the past, you miss what's in front of you and that is the future. And I love this city more than anything. And I love talking about St. Louis U High versus Chaminade and what the stars and the steamers and the ambush and the Athletica and everything we did but today and eight days from now, it starts. It starts because nobody right now cares what we did for the last 60 to 70 years. Not a single soul does. And for the last 25 years of my professional life, I've bragged and told anyone and their ears are bleeding about what this city is gonna do. But everyone in this room, you are an ambassador of the game. I don't care, and Bradley's gonna hate this, if you don't like the way they're playing, talk about it, call in. Go to games, sell the game. This is the time where we get to show off what St. Louis soccer is all about. I loved everything about my upbringing in the high school and the college games and everything it did. But it starts new now. And if it doesn't, we are gonna be left behind because I see what the Atlantas and the LAFCs and the Cincinnati's and the Nashville's and Kansas City, of God's sakes, right? Like Kansas City, guys? Huh? But in all seriousness, kidding aside, let's take this thing to the moon. Let's make sure when the World Cup comes here, Italy, Ireland, Germany, everyone is fighting to make St. Louis the hub of their training facility because it's gonna happen. But the only way we do that is through St. Louis City. Bradley Carnell, come on up, brother. I took the short route. Oh boy, where do you want to start? Um, what was the first thought you had about St. Louis when you got here? Wow, toasted raviolis. <laughs> <laughs> Something up yes or no? Do you like him or no? No. Okay. All righty. Good. All right. Good. Bradley Cardinal, everybody. Thank you. But I would like to start with recognition to everyone sitting here. Yeah. Right. So for the last 12, 13 months, just being able to be given the platform, the mm -hmm. opportunity to build something together with the Taylor family, uh, as well as Lutz, just for the the history to find out what the city is all about yeah. has been an incredibly humbling story, experience, and now to know people in the room that offered so much service to the game. Yep. And, and we, I believe we're all servants to the game, right? Uh, what can we do for the next generation, the next player? How can we help them along their careers? And while we go through many moments of, of thinking about eyes, you know, a lot of kids who think about I and what the game can do for me, I think it's the other way around. What can we always do for the game? You yep. know, so thank you for your service to everyone who was sitting in this. Uh, well said. Yeah. So, which, go which, ahead. Which leads me to the very first meeting we had um, as a group yeah. on the 8th uh, of January. That's what I was going to ask you. So the very first meeting, and now I know we're on the right track. It was a picture of the arch with the St. Louisans who represented America in that famous 1950 World Cup game against England, right? So we, we spoke to the players, we said, we are not the first ones here, boys. We are definitely not the first ones. We might be the first MLS team, but there's a history here, you know? There are certain levels of standards, and the standards have been given prior to us being e ever e even in St. Louis. So for that, this has been driving me for a year now, and the, every day I've spent here fuels me every single day to see what the boys are putting out, to see now the preseason, to see all the plan coming together, um, I know we're on the right track. 
you've been around the world, and I think a lot of people in this room really, really wouldn't know Germany, you're from South Africa, just where your career is taking New York. Are you happy you're here now? Because you went through a lot. You went through the pandemic, then you make this move. Lutz calls you, says we're doing an expansion team. You've been in this league for a long time, long enough to know the expansion team, it, it, it's a difficult one. And yet I see your face. I see you at training today. I feel like you're just absolutely loving being here right now. So one thing you don't know about me, um, <laughs> you spoke about being a competitor, right? Always knowing as a young 16-year-old, um, as the youngest ever to turn pro in South Africa, you had to be something different yep. to play in a segregated sport, to be the only white kid at that time playing in a black sport, right? So uh, it was almost roles reversed in yep. terms of segregation in South Africa. But to stay true and committed to the cause and to make a difference in some form or fashion, um, to represent my family, to represent exactly what I do and what I stand for, um, and then to be accepted into FIFA, uh, South Africa was sanctioned. So we've come a long way. You spoke about it coming a long way just in the US, but you know, being able to live on three different continents, being able to you know, live in three different countries, uh, speak different languages and what have you. So you have to go a tricky road to get to your destination sometimes. And it's not always smooth and it's, uh, you know, there's always obstacles. But, you know, I feel with the competitive willingness of what the city embraces and how I am as an individual and what I believe in, I believe you are nothing without your past, right? That shapes our futures um, for me. And, and this is exactly, my kids always tell me, Dad, you're so old-fashioned, old you know, um, because I always... You know, always wanted to live in the footsteps of how my dad taught me and yeah. the rules, respect. But you dress like a cool dad. <laughs> what, what are the kids doing? My kids, you don't want to know the conversations <laughs> I have with my kids. Dad, you're so old-fashioned. We don't want to hear these stories. I'm not one of your players, dad. You know, like. <laughs> so, yeah, um, it comes full turn, right? You said it. It, yeah. it comes full turn. The ball, I believe, is round and, and it goes around uh, until it's your turn. So, uh, extremely grateful and humbled to be given this opportunity. Yep. So, um, yeah. Eight days from now. You're going to be opening up your season, this franchise history. Uh, it's been over 900 days since Carolyn looked me in the eye and said she's going to pull it off. I know this city is going to be rocking and rolling on March 4th. But eight days from now, you open up. Are you ready? Yeah, the players are ready. You know, um, one of the things we spoke about, and, and you and I were talking, talking off, uh, off air off the stage here, you said something about St. Louis. Yep. There's an edge. Oh, yeah. One of our players came back from the Apple event. Um, Roman Berkey and Klaus, yeah. uh, they came back to me and they were pretty upset. They said, coach, there's something that they're saying with the MLS and obviously they're from Europe and, and Brazil and you know, all over the place. And they said, not too sure. I feel like we've been training for three weeks, but I feel we can compete. I feel we're a team. I feel the bond with the group of these groups of young, talented individuals and great people. I feel there's a togetherness in this team that we feel ready for, for a challenge, right? We feel ready for something. Mm -hmm. And that's what I see every single day. So we want to embrace every game that we play with an edge. Yep. We know we respect the city and the history of the city, but I think the players also have a point to prove. Yep. And, and we want to use this edge as a driving factor for us in every single game. Um, and that we want to make felt on the team, you yep. know, on the field, whether you've, we're playing at home or away. Yep. You've been in this league for what, five years, six years? Six, this is, my this six is your year. six yeah. years, correct? And so for those that are out here that don't know anything about Major League Soccer, are intrigued about Major League Soccer, and they're tired of me talking about Major League Soccer, what would you say? What's one thing you would say about the league that they should be excited to experience? Well, I mean, for me as a South African living in Germany, yep. the travel is one of the biggest challenges, that <laughs> you know, just the travel, right? Um, I think in the Bundesliga, you travel 3,000 miles throughout a season. I think in the La Liga, you travel 8,000 miles. In, in the English Premier League, you travel 4,000 miles for a 37-match uh, day or 38-match day uh, season. In this league, you travel 38,000 miles. So there's a distinct difference. So we have a bunch of guys from Europe. We have some young kids coming through the ranks. We have some players with, at different walks of life, yep. different moments of their careers with different points to prove. And I feel this is one of the driving factors of this group. And, and I'm extremely proud to be part of this group. Uh, we've had some intimate sessions yep. on, you know, not talking just about the training sessions, but intimate meetings with these players where they've really opened up and, and connected as a group. And we share things. Um, and it's just part of the, you know, uh, when, I, when I presented to Carolyn, I had a little triangle of people, purpose, principles, and passion, right? 
But at the triangle, the top piece is the smallest piece. Yep. So if I'm starting with people, I just flip the triangle. So I have inverted triangles. So for me, it starts with the people. And we all have our why. We all have our purpose, right? Um, and then the principles drive us every single day to, you know, what we do essentially. And if you don't have passion, man, then you have to be out the game. Yep. The, the passion drives you. Yeah. Um, but for me, the biggest thing starts and ends with the person. So what, what are we going to see when we show up in the team wearing city red on March 4th? Yeah, what, what, I mean, what are we going to see? If you look at Lutz's history, um, where he's come from, my history, where I've come from, yes, we want a certain energy and style of play. But we want to control the chaos. Right, we want to control it in moments where, you know, I think we have a pretty good, um, you know, our teams or this the pressing style or the the pressing philosophy is not normally the most, I would say, in the global scale. Yep. People always have something to say about that part of the game, and I do. I, I feel I feel this group has taught me a few things yep. and has challenged me as a coach. Um, and, and this, I'm mean, really excited to, to see because we have had a, a little stretch now over five games against different opponents in the league. The Galaxies, the Vancouver's, the New York Cities, who've won silverware. Philadelphia, who won silverware in a, con you know, Eastern Conference uh, winners. We've, we've played with an edge. We've competed. We've been unbeaten for four of those five games, you know. So if we're looking forwards, I think we... We don't have to, you know, be afraid of anything. I texted Jim Curtin this morning, and you said nobody's going to want to play them. And I think everyone here from St. Louis that knows St. Louis loves to hear that. And when the 20,000 people show up at City Park and it's loud and nasty, I think it's going to be an interesting experience for a lot of people. If I asked you, Bradley, right now, one thing that you are going to stamp right now that you love about your team, what is it? Just go to the end. Don't give up. Don't quit. You know, just... Just one of the things that I've seen and sensed with this group, and I feel there's a, there's a driving factor among the individual and a driving factor amongst the units, you know, whether it's defenders, midfielders, attackers. There's, there's just a sense of self-drive at the moment yep. um, and a point to prove. Um, and it's a great compliment from Jim. For sure, we'll have ups and downs and yep. ebbs and flows, and we'll fail and grow and move on and, and get ready for the next one. And, you know, it's, you, you told me about the expansion yeah. franchise and the difficulty but that's going to drive us you know yeah. that's you, obviously if you look at success we've been here a year i've been here a year now and and this is by no means an i you know i don't yep. stand for the i in what we do uh you look at the academy first year outfit you know making the playoffs you look at next pro bringing silverware home on the first year with the western conference getting to a uh, to a to a cup final so you know we're already creating a new set of history yep. <laughs> books yep. within within our current time. So extremely grateful for, to be given the time to build all of that. And then probably the most humbling thing for us is to call Caden Glover our first homegrown, you yep. know, at 15. So, um, and for sure, and I can guarantee you he's not the, he's not the last one. No, nope, um, he just dropped a hint, by the way. Keep an eye on that one. <laughs> you did. <laughs> I did. I did. So, I mean, and this is what, what drives me as a coach, yep. right? So... Um, on preseason, we shared hotels with uh, one of the former employee at the Red Bulls, you know. Yep. So one of the players came to me. He was number one draft pick for Cincinnati. And he didn't really cut it at Cincinnati, up and down, right? I'm not yep. going to mention names. And Frankie then, Meyer, go ahead. And then he gets to the Red Bulls um, and also has a tough time just settling in. It's very much self, you know, self-driven, self-centered, selfless. Um, and we, you know, I preach a selflessness, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, don't think what the game can give you, what can you give the game, right? So the first thing he did was give me a hug. I'm like, Frankie, long time, no see, you know, he says, no, congratulations. And he gave me a big hug and he said, it finally dropped. All this shit, excuse me, you're fine. You used to give me every single day about, you know, be a better teammate, take ownership. It's yep. not about you. He gave me a big hug and he said, Brad, it finally dropped. Thank you very much. So this for me was incredibly humbling. Yeah, there, there's moments in your life as a coach where you get that feeling, and I'm sure that was one of them. The last one I would have for you because I was here early and, and just mingling, telling stories and, and listening to stories, and everyone's asking me, how would you define success for St. Louis City in the first year? And I could go Bradley a million ways, right? 
I was asked this uh, for Apple and ESPN on SportsCenter about the preview for MLS, and they said, what's the most important thing for St. Louis City? And I actually said the fans and the crowd because they're going to have the biggest impact of what this team is. But for you as the manager, you're living it every single day. You're rolling up your sleeves. How do you define success in this first year? Yeah, listen, I mean, define success. If you look at the win column and you get more wins uh, than you do losses. I like you more and more. You know, <laughs> and, and again, I'm, <laughs> I'm not guaranteed. There's no guarantees. Right? No, that's there's not no what I asked you. I asked you how you define success. There's no guarantees in, in what tomorrow brings, but you can only build foundations and platforms that set you up for success, right? And I feel we've been given a platform. We've bought We've had the liberty of bringing players since last year, right? So just imagine bringing seven Europeans right now in January. Acclimate, find, find homes for your families, get your yep. kids to school, learn the language. Um, there's so many things. I'm thinking about Selmir Pedro, you know, yep. comes from Bosnia. This is like, wow, uh, America, you know, this is incredible. So it's a lot to take in. I see this now with uh, Jabula Blom. A kid from South Africa at the age of 23, never left the country, never seen a snowflake, never experienced, you know, freezing. Toasted ravioli. <laughs> Toasted raviolis, never experienced a lot of things, right? So for, for kids to ingest all of that, right? So we feel we've been given this platform to succeed. We want to be competitive, right? So I, I said, what does success look like? Well, the academy is up and running, doing great. Next Pro is up and running, doing great. So if we can get up and running the first year and strive for greatness, wherever that takes us, you know, I just want to be competitive. Are you a Cardinals and Blues fan yet or no? I am. Okay, good. Just good answer. I just want to make sure you said no. that rightly. So, <laughs> short story. One of my best friends in Germany, South African guy, Sean, he's a big Cardinals fan, and he always speaks about the cards. I, lo uh, I love Sean from he, South Africa. He wants, to, he wants to visit me in August. There's a four-day stretch against the Mets, he says. He, oh! He doesn't want to. He doesn't of want course to he does. The they just so, spent $4 billion. You know, Yeah. So I can't wait for him to come and visit us. Um, <laughs> but we're all in. You know? He knows so, it's not rounders or cricket where it's like a four-day game, correct? No, okay. he wants to be there. Trust me. Yeah, trust me. So we're all in. We love going to the Blues games. Yeah. Um, my family's feel so at home here in, in uh, St. Louis, Kirkwood, Kirkwood United. Yeah, was Kirkwood, that? yeah. You know? <laughs> um, my wife put up, quick story of my wife, you know, we go away on preseason camp. She sends me a photo of the flagpole with the St. Louis flag. So, oh, I love you it. know, we're all in um, and we're here and grateful to be yep. here. Awesome. Just word of advice, if you lose a couple games, take the flagpole <laughs> down, just so we don't know. Um, but in all seriousness, Bradley, I think I speak for everyone in this room. Welcome to St. Louis. Good luck. We hope you kick ass and represent St. Louis City and this city at the highest of levels. And I wish you the best of luck, my man. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Absolutely. So we got two trivia questions. Actually, let me grab one of those. So, we'll, so, so today... Um, I was busy this morning. St. Louis City, uh, I guess, introduced their new away kit, which is really sharp. Okay. I figured you guys wanted to keep the jersey, so I didn't put number 20, 12 on the back. Everyone at that lovely table over there signed it. Bradley, I need you to sign it before. Do we have a pen for Bradley to sign it real quick? Thank you. But I got two trivia questions. And they're not about me, so there'll be good ones. Bradley signed those two for me. All right, and we gotta raise our hand. First question. Oh, come on. Kevin Kalish, you cannot answer this question. How many soccer national championships has St. Louis University won? Dan Donegan, no. <laughs> Don't answer. The gentleman that knows my Uncle Bart. No, you gotta go home, that's terrible. What's yours, sir? Seven, no. Yes, you. Ten, that jersey's yours, my man. I mean, I set you two up. Five? It's a terrible, it's not a trivia question if it's five. Oh, this is a good one. This is a good one. I actually think the answer written down might be wrong. St. Louis City joins MLS. How many franchises are now in the league? Yes, 29, yes sir. Yeah, it's fine. 
It's all good. Hold on, someone's. Hello? Steve, it's Joe Buck. He said he wished he would have came tonight. Uh, that's it for the night. Obviously, Bradley starts. St. Louis City starts in eight days. March 4th, home opener, franchise history against Charlotte. I will be here. Thank you. This was fun.